I'm going to give you a challenge today. Some of you, uh, it'll be more of a challenge than others. I'm going to challenge you to join me in thinking back to when you were 18 years old. 18 years old. You remember that was the time when everybody seemed to want to ask you what you were going to do after high school. Many of your friends are going on to college. Many of your friends may have jobs waiting for them. Others are heading off to uh, experience life a little bit before settling into uh, some kind of a routine. But you, you've made the decision you're going to serve your country. You're going to wear the cloth of the nation. And you've made the decision that you're going to join the United States Army. Now I'm going to ask you to tweak your chronology meter to ahead just a little bit, about two and a half years. You not only joined the Army, but you are now climbing the hillside, a rocky hillside in a distant land. And since you've been in for two years, you're not just there by yourself, you're now a squad leader. There are eight other individuals that you're now responsible for. And every decision you make is a life and death decision, not just for yourself, but for those that are following you. You're quite literally carrying their lives in your backpack as you pick your way along this rocky trail. You could have never imagined just a short two, two and a half years prior to that when you joined the Army that you would have this level of responsibility and accountability so early in your life. Maybe you didn't join the Army. Maybe you joined the Navy, the United States Navy. You joined and you joined the nuclear power program. And today you find yourself sitting at the reactor plant control panel on a nuclear powered submarine, submerged hundreds of feet beneath the Arctic Ocean, in a situation where on the surface you have 20 feet of ice, a situation in which whatever happens you can't surface, and you're controlling a nuclear reactor. 140 of your shipmates are counting on you to control that reactor that provides all the propulsion and all the power to every system in the ship. You could have never imagined that you would have that level of responsibility. Friends, let me tell you, the two scenarios I just gave you are not fictional. They are occurring as we speak. As we said here today, there are men and women in our military services that are carrying out missions just this, this important. And it doesn't occur just in the Army and the Navy. It occurs in the United States Marine Corps, the United States Air Force, and the United States Coast Guard. And they are so good at building these young men and women and giving them, handing them this responsibility at these critical junctures in their life, at a time in their life when I can't think of another occupation or another organization would hand that level of responsibility to people of that age. But they are so good at doing it, they don't even recognize that they're doing it. It's just something that they do. So today, I'd like to talk to you just briefly about our military and the effects our military can have in our communities. Now you'd have every right to ask me, what gives you license? What are your qualifications to speak to this topic? And I'd be very proud to tell you, as you heard, I s I've served 35 years wearing the uniform of the United States Navy. In that 35 years, I served on three submarines, a nuclear guided missile cruiser, and two aircraft carriers. I served at five different training commands for the United States Navy. In five of those commands that I just mentioned, I served as a senior enlisted leader of those commands. And for the last four years of that 35 years, I was fortunate enough to be selected and had the honor of serving as the ninth Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy. My job and the job of my counterparts in the other four services, my counterparts being the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army, Jack Tilley, the 14th Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, Al McMichael, who are in the audience with us today, the 13th Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, and the 8th Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, Vince Patton. Our job was to take stock of the enlisted force of, the, of the, our, each of our services and provide advice on all matters affecting them and policies affecting them to our bosses, the Joint Chiefs, the service secretaries, the Secretary of Defense, to Congress, and to the President of the United States. I'm very proud of that. 
And today we have what is undeniably the finest fighting force that the world has ever known. There are two components that really get, make it the very best. The first and foremost are the exceptional people that serve today. They are incredible. And while we go out, my counterparts and I, we go out to the, the country at writ large and talk about these incredible men and women, we find that there's a little bit of a misunderstanding of about who they are. All too often when we talk to people, it appears to us that sometimes people think these are people that cannot do something else after high school, so they join the military. I can assure you that is the farthest thing from the truth. In fact, less than 25% of the recruitable age population of our entire country can meet the eligibility requirements to serve in uniform today. Let me say that another way. Over 75% of the recruitable age population of our country fail to meet enlistment standards either mentally, physically, or morally. One in five high school graduates today cannot pass the aptitude battery with a high enough score to serve in uniform. That should concern us all. But these young men and women that step forward and do this are absolutely incredible. These are not people that couldn't do something else in life. These are people that could go do anything else in life. They have chosen to serve their country. The second element that makes our, our, our military the very best is our investment in them. Your investment and my investment. We certainly invest our children, our, our most precious possessions. But we do something else. Every year we invest six to eight billion dollars in their growth and development. We support them with the finest technical training and skill training on the face of the earth. We provide them the opportunity to seek higher education while in uniform. And we support the organizations that allow them to develop attributes that we all wish we had more of in our country. We do this year in and year out. Each year, more come in and others leave. And as they leave, to the tune of about a quarter of a million per year, they assume a new title, and that title is veteran. They're veterans of the United States military. And while they leave, they look a lot like veterans of all eras in the past. They're incredibly proud to have had the opportunity to serve their country and very proud of how they did that. They're humble beyond belief. They don't ask for much. In fact, what they really desire more than anything else is to come back to communities across our entire nation and, and participate in communities where they can raise incredible families. Families that I might add that have a propensity to go and do and serve their country also. But while they're like veterans of many of all eras past, they're also vastly different. We have never returned veterans to communities across the country with greater technical skills than we do today. They understand they, and know how to use technology far in advance of any veteran group that has ever left the military. They are more highly educated than any group that we've ever returned. Today, more than 20% of them return with at least a bachelor's degree. Nearly 10% with graduate degrees and over 75% have at least some college education as they take the uniform off and resume life as civilians. So, the big question today is how do we use that? And I would tell you we sub-optimize it day in and day out. Again, we sub-optimize it in two ways. First and foremost is through employment. You've all heard the commercials, you've all heard the talk shows about giving veterans jobs and trying to, trying to find employment for veterans. This amuses me, it deeply amuses me. Because if people understood veterans the way that I understand veterans, they would be competing to give them jobs. There wouldn't be enough to go around. They have the ability to apply technology and their education and attributes in the workplace like never before. Quite frankly, the people that would benefit most by having these people in their workforce are the small to medium-sized business owners. 
you know, if you're a small to medium-sized business owner, you're one deep in every, in every position. And when that person doesn't show up for the day or does it, doesn't do the job right, the entire company sputters. If I were to assemble a group of hiring managers or CEOs in a room and said, let's compile a list, a list of the best attributes you would like to have in your perfect employee, I know I could take that list and overlay it on the list of attributes that the typical veteran join, rejoins communities today with and it would match almost word for word. Attributes like sophisticated leadership skills, how to work in teams, a real sense of teamwork, a real value for diversity, an incredible work ethic, self-discipline, accountability, reliability, dependability, integrity. These are all things that we wish we had a lot more of in our country. And every veteran comes out of the service with an abundance. So, why do we use that? Well, I'm going to give you a little secret. I'm going to let you in on a, a really big secret, as a matter of fact. A secret that every military community adjacent to bases throughout our country know. These folks have a propensity to to volunteer in numbers that you wouldn't believe. When you go into communities surrounding our military installations, you will find people in you that, that wear uniform during the day. You'll find them in their schools. You'll find them in youth programs. You'll find them coaching, mentoring, teaching. You'll, have, you'll find them in habitability programs. You'll find them in, in aging programs. And they make a real difference. There's not a community around a base that has not been affected by the volunteerism and the skills, knowledge, and abilities of the people that serve in our military. We could make that same effect and have the same effect in every community in this country, and there's not a community in our country that could not use that help. We struggle with dropout rates. We struggle with reading levels. We struggle with crime, poverty, habitability. And yet, we don't optimize the, re the resources that we have in, our, in our, our very midst in our communities as these veterans return. Ladies and gentlemen, these men and women are exceptional people. They stepped forward when others did not. They stood before a flag, raised their right hand, and swore to defend our Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic and to obey the orders of those appointed over them. They left family and hometowns to go do that. They carry our flag to the four corners of this earth to defend us with their lives if necessary so that we can live the life that we enjoy today. We invest in them. Our investment is not meager, it is not timid, it is bold, and we expect a lot for that investment. We could do a lot more with it. So I ask one thing of you today, only one thing, and that is the next time you're in your community and you have the opportunity to meet a veteran and shake their hand, as I know you will, and say to them, thank you for your service, as I know you do. I would just ask you to ask one more thing. Tell me what I can do to help you give you the opportunity to make this community better, grow better citizens, and make our country stronger. You will be amazed at the answer. Thank you.